My name is Alfred Emmerich, and my previous name used to be Alfred Königsberger. Through the circumstances of life, I changed uh, my name to Emmerich, but I shall tell you that as we go along in my story. I think my story should be told to everybody in this world because it's outstanding, it's different than you've ever heard from anybody. Let's hear about your story, Fred. Tell us about okay. your story. It started out, I got separated from my parents at 1930 because uh, they had to escape from Germany because they were anti-Nazis. And at that time, I did not know that he was a double agent. So that's, and then that, that was the Nazis' biggest effort to get him. But in the meantime, they had to get rid of us, which they, we couldn't travel with them, it was too dangerous. So they had put us in an orphanage in Frankfurt, Germany. And we were in that orphanage for nine years. And let me tell you something, once you got in, you never got out, unless somebody wants to adopt you, which has never happened. But what I mean, it was just, you never got out the street, you never went anywhere. And you own nothing. Everybody is one and one for all. So if you had a marble, that marble belonged to the 35 kids who lived there. If you had anything, you had a shared. Of course, nobody had anything. But uh, and how were you? How were you treated there, I Fred? Was, we were treated, as far as I know, after all, I was three years old at the time. I didn't know one one from the other. But as far as I know, they treated us. I felt very comfortable. But the one thing I remember as I as I became older, they definitely segregated us. The older boys went in one barracks, and you know by age group, which was a good thing because there would have there could have been conflicts because of the age factor. But the thing is, you had to be a self-made man. And by, by the, what I mean by that is, when you went outside and to play, which every day you had to, everybody had to go out and play. And then, you know, there's always a group of kids who are bullies. And the, one of the bullies came to me and says, I want that swing. I says, no, you can't have it. And he's always trying to push me around. So I found something and I whacked them over the head. So of course he ran away, but he immediately went to the supervisor and said, oh, you know that Fred, he just beat the hell out of me. So the super, after his suicide, supervisor came to me and says, Fred, we don't want you to have any fights. That's not allowed here. Let the bully have a few, few seconds of the swing. That's all he wants. He wants to show his superior. But he says, no, I'm a just as, a, I have just as much right to do this thing as he has. I would not give it up. So anyway, he never bothered me again. Was there any adults in the orphanage that were kind to you or mean to you? There was not a, never a mean person. They were always very compassionate, and uh, which is what I really, in each group, they had one supervisor, uh, well, I don't know, whatever they call them. But anyway, if you had a problem, you could talk to them. But uh, what are you going to talk about when you're four years old? You don't, you don't know what goes on in the world. You don't know anything. So all I know, it was a Jewish orphanage. The reason I know it's Jewish because they had a synagogue on the premises. And they always used to come on Sat Friday night and Saturday morning, the old men with their beards, and they were jumbling, dumbling all for hours in the, in the temple. And we had to go sit up in the back and listen to them, whatever they were doing. Because to us, it was a joke. But uh, you know, when you're four or five years old, you don't know what goes on. And nobody explained it to you. You only knew if there was a holiday is because on, on Hanukkah, on Hanukkah, they had light the menorah, they had a beautiful big menorah, and that we all sang Hanukkah songs, and that was that. And on Passover, that's the only time uh, we had uh, matzah. Every morning we had uh, buttermilk and a roll. And, and the roll was the only thing you got was jam. But every now and then, somebody along the line must have donated some butter. So that day, it was inconsistent, but when it happened, I thought it was a holiday. And to this day, when I eat butter and jam on a roll, I think I'm on a holiday. It's amazing, after all these years, it still sticks with me. So you were there for nine years? Nine years. Give me the, what year you started and what year you, you, you ended. We came there in 1932 and left in 1939. Did you know what was happening outside of the orphanage as far as Hitler and what was going on? Nothing. Nobody came and nobody came and nobody left. Did you no have news. any interactions with adults other than the people that were... Uh... We do not. 
No, nobody. I mean, there was just nobody there. The only adults we had are the supervisors who took care of us. So it was basically kind of a Lord of the Flies thing, and there was just young boys together with just a few adults, while meanwhile Germany's falling apart all around you, and you had no idea what correct. was going on. That is absolutely correct. And then what happened? Well, then one day, uh, one of the su uh, supervisors came over here and said, we just got a letter from the... Uh, not the American Red Cross, the International Red Cross, telling us that the three boys, I had another brother who lived with me and another brother in another institute also in Or He said, we are going to the Philippines. Now we said, what, where in the world is the Philippines? So the, they gave us an atlas and we started looking around on it and we found it that it's completely on the other side of the world. So how long were you on this boat? For 28 days and it was like heaven. Nobody told us what to do, how to do, when to do. We could eat anything we want, do anything we want. Nobody told us anything. We had a beautiful cabin by ourselves. We were fortunate enough to we were, somebody paid. We were in second class. We were not down in storage like the rest of, unfortunately, all the Jews were. So you had the time of your life. Oh, the best ever. You left the orphanage where it was very contained and you're on a ship in the middle of the ocean for 28 days. Right. And the food was fabulous? Fabulous. It's the first time I lay in my life I ever ate spaghetti and I had spaghetti for 28 days. I had bologna for, for 28 days, besides everything else. But that was so good. Of course, another thing on the, on the ship, they had to find us a steward who spoke German because that's all we spoke. We didn't know Italian or any other languages, so, which they did. They assigned a guy to us and he took care of us while we were on the ship. Now, I remember you telling me you guys did some smoking and some drinking too. Oh, Talk they, about that. Anything you want. If you want a wine, he brought the bottles of wine. If you want to smoke, you can smoke. You want a cigar, because like everything else, like kids are, they tried anything. How old were you on this cruise ship? I was nine years old. And you were smoking and drinking? Sure. Did you get drunk? Oh, I don't know. I don't remember. But it was fun. Well, I only took a puff of one. Okay. Two, just to see what it feels like. But it was an incredible adventure. Adventure fab. We went wherever the ship stopped. We went off the boat and went to two of the, the cities or the country we were. Nobody asked any question, paid for nothing. I don't know how, it, I, I have no idea how we managed to with no money and nothing. The only thing I remember was when we left Germany, we had to go by train to G uh, G Genoa. And that was the craziest thing. We had a piece of paper from German government with a swastika stamp on it. And they handed that to my brother number two because he was the most aggressive of the three of us. And when we got on the, on the, on the train, they took us from Frankfurt on the train to went directly to uh, Genoa. So anyway, every hour or so, the, the train stopped and the Gestapo, of course at the time I didn't know what these people were, but the Gestapo stopped, paper, show me your papers, show me your papers. So we showed them the paper, and they took wooden look, and I couldn't believe it. They were so flabbergasted. They read the paper, saluted it, Heil Hitler, put that piece of paper on the window, because it took quite a, I don't know, maybe a day or two to get to Switzerland, or Geneva. And nobody ever bothered us again. Nobody. So that must have been scary until it wasn't scary, right? Yeah, because you didn't know what was going on. I mean, then we, I mean, once we got on the train stage, we could see the, People getting bullied around, with, you know, and of course, by that time I was nine, you get that, you could figure something is very wrong. Uh -huh. And of course, we saw the swastika flags all over the place. Did anybody talk about any of that? Nobody. So you were like in an island in the middle of nowhere in that orphanage, and yeah. then you come out of that, and all this German stuff's going on, and you had no clue what you were encountering. That is correct. How were you afraid? I don't know to be afraid. I've never been afraid in my life. I don't know to be afraid. It was an adventure. Just like you said, it was an adventure. And of course, then we got to the Genoa, and, the, and there were the, the, also the you know, uh, International Red Cross assigned a couple. That was the funniest thing. They assigned a couple who would had a son the same age as my older brother. He's five years older than I am. Okay. So they figured we, would, we might be compatible on the ship. But, of course, so they met us and they took us on the ship. And, of course, the crazy thing was, these people were poor and they were down in steerage. Oh. You see, so once they got us on the ship, they went in back. You never saw them again. Never saw them again. But every now and then, we just thought, God, we ought to see these people to see who they are. 
And then the first thing they said, bring us food. They don't feed us down there. Wow. So every day we used to go to the kitchen and ask for food. And of course, the cooks were happy to give us all the food we wanted. So we put it in a bag or something and brought it down. We you did, went downstairs and fed people? Yeah. Wow. Because they were crying for food. We had all the food we wanted up there. We could never eat it all. So. Did you see the movie Titanic? Yes. So how, how nice was this ship where you won? Was it a really Same nice thing. ship? Same thing. Really nice, Gorgeous huh? upstairs. Our cabins were beautiful. And then when I went down below in the storage, it was horrible. Yeah, first of all, I had these gates there. Yeah. And people couldn't get out. Okay, like a prison almost, yeah, huh? Yeah, it was. That's correct. It was just like a I, 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 Of course, at that time, I had feeling. I felt very, very bad. But then, as I said, we never really saw them. And then we know they were going to Shanghai and we were going to the Philippines. But it was all Jews on the boat, right? I would imagine so. I would say 99%. I know 3,000 Jews were down below. Escaping Germany. Escaping Germany. And going to China. And going to China. Wow. So, anyway, so that's so, anyway. But then once we got to the, to the Philippines after 28 days, uh, they stopped in Manila, and that, that was the craziest damn thing. Of course, we had no idea, at least I did, I had no idea what my mother looks like. How old were you right now? I was going 10 on 11, I guess. In okay. That eight range. A young boy. A young boy. But there were maybe hundreds of Filipinos, or, or not white people anyway. I don't know what they were, but yeah. she was the only occasion woman standing there. You saw your mom on the dock. I didn't know it was my mother. We just assumed that must be our mother because she was the only white woman there. And what happened when you came? She was waving, you said. Tell me about that. Well, she waved at us and waved, we waved back to her, but she thought maybe we would embrace her and kiss her and all that, but there was, there was no feeling, which is really sad. So what was your mom like? Describe your mother. I can't remember. Really? You don't remember her? Do you have good feelings for your mother? Oh yeah, I was. She was. I. She tried very hard to be a good mother. Was she pretty? I think so. Huh? Yes. Did I, you have to kind of block that out? Because yes, you remember I, a lot of details. Why don't you remember her? I don't know. You remember your stepdad, though, right? Yes, because he made such an impression on me. Tell me about your stepdad. What was his name? His name was Otto Emmerich. Otto Henry Emmerich. Okay. Now the reason my last name is Emmerich uh, that comes along in a little while, but. Uh, as, at the time, our name, my name was Koenigsberger because my real father, which I've never met, uh -huh. have no idea what he looked like. Uh, his name was Koenigsberger. Describe your stepdad. Was he, was he handsome? Was he, was he muscular? Was he smart? Give us a description of him. My stepper was a very smart man and he was good looking, very uh, muscular uh, person. He was very... Very good looking. Was he loving? I don't know. He you don't know strict. about that? Strict. Strict. What? I don't know if he was loving, but I, I didn't care. He, as far as I'm concerned, he was God on earth. Your stepfather was God on earth. That's right. He could not do enough for me to get educated and get to know, get to, get to be worldly. That was the most important, and learn self-confidence. And he instilled that in me all the time. Give me some examples about how he did that, Fred. The self-confidence? Yeah, the, the, the helping you in all the different ways that he helped you. Well, first of all, uh, we were in the island of Mindanao, the city of Davao. When the Japanese invaded the Philippines, or Davao anyway, in 1941, in December the 24th, I remember the day, they invaded, the, they bombed the hell out of Davao. And of course, we were in the city of Davao, and myself and my mother got very badly hurt, especially me, but not so much my mother. She just got bomb shrapnels. So anyway, I was very sadly hurt. Were I, you inside when this happened? Where, where did you get uh, hit? We were outside, actually, actually outside in the, in, the, in the forest. You were out in the middle of the forest yes. and the shrapnel yeah, damaged you. Yeah, because they you. bombed everything, everywhere. Wherever they could bomb, wherever they saw something move, they dropped bombs. Just hundreds of bombs oh, everywhere. Hundreds of bombs everywhere. Well, anyway, of course, I did, at the time, I really didn't know I got hurt. But all of a sudden, I felt very hot on the side, on my, on my right side. And I looked at it, and I said, my God, look at that. Uh, all that blood in my hand. And then I looked, and I said, sure enough, I saw a great big hole under my arm. Wow. And anyway, so the minute my mother saw it, she went crazy. So she said, we got to do something. So she ripped her clothing 
and stuffed the cloth in the hole, laid me down, and then she screamed at my brother, go, go find some water anywhere because he needs water because uh, he is dehydrating right. by replacing with water. You could have bled to death really easily, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. If it wasn't for mother, there's no doubt about it. Where was your stepfather at the time? Who knows? He, he was could, not around, He huh? was not around. I haven't seen him in months. Of course, he was doing his job as a spy. Okay. He was very busy making contact with the American government. Did he ever tell you about his spying? Never. So that was a secret to you? Uh, the secret, he would never and never, never talk about it. He had never hardly ever talked about World War I, which he was an officer. So how did you find out he was a spy then? Well, many, many years later, maybe in 1974, 75, we went to visit my sister who lived in Switzerland. That's another story about my sister. All right, let's not go there. So Yeah, continue with him. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, was he still living in the mid-70s? Yeah. When did he die? I think he did. I, I don't know. Okay. Maybe he did die in the seventies. All right. I, I'm not sure. I can't. But, but what he did was you, only fifty-four years old. When he what died. did you What did you think when your sister told you that your stepdad was a spy? I was flabbergasted. But uh, here again, there was a problem. My sister couldn't talk. She could only use sign, uh, uh, sign language. Okay. But her, but her husband knew everything. So he in turn told me, and then if it was true, she blinked her eyes or smiled, and that was her communication. So you were in your mid 40s or something, or late 40s when you found out? Yes. And you had no idea, but he was the God on earth because he helped you, but you had no idea he was doing all the spying on the, That's on the side. That's right. Wow. Very right. So anyway, and the reason why I think he's God on earth, after we finally left Davao, because the Japanese, we did not trust the Japanese, because the Japanese person, if he sees a Caucasian person, they think they must be an American. What else? They don't know anything about a German or anything else. So we said it's too dangerous. He figured that out right away. Too dangerous to be around here. So what we did is after I was able to uh, be transported. To transported away from the city, we moved out in the country, and the minute we found a house in the country, which was no problem, uh, the Japanese came in and they took over. Uh, what did they? Oh, they took over the downstairs of the house. It so you had to live with step. the Japanese we below you, huh? Yeah, just for a few months. Because okay. We know it's going to be dangerous. Were they nice or were they mean? They were or? disgusting. And how were they mm. disgusting? Well, they, they took everything you owned. They had, they themselves had nothing. Whatever you had was theirs. So were you angry or how did you feel about all that? Well, here again, I was a kid. I had no real feeling. I just said to myself, it's not right that they're taking our food away. Okay, right. Because we had so little ourselves. But we fooled them anyway. But this is before you got hurt, though, right? No, no, this after. is after. No, before the war, we had a wonderful relations with the Japanese families. No kidding. No problem. And the family themselves said, from now that this, have the Japanese in the occupation, we cannot be your friend anymore. Wow. Because if we are your friend... They might come after gonna, me. That is correct. Wow. They're they going to kill us because you are friendly with the Americans. Now, you wrote a book called Jungle Boy. So how did you go from that house with the Japanese below you to the jungle in the middle of nowhere? What, what was that story about? Well, that's going to start right now. So after we left the city of Davao, we found a house maybe 20 miles away from the city, but right on the ocean. So he says, we're gonna stay here. But then these guys right away, they followed us and they occupied the top. No, they occupied the bottom and we were on top. But they had, they stole our chickens and our rice and all that. He says, but we're gonna get even with them because we still, so we drilled a hole in the floor, the bamboo floor and made a lasso. And then we dropped a few kernels of corn down and the chickens were so hungry, they immediately went to that hole to the lasso. So okay. we needed to find the middle lasso, we pulled them up, we had chicken. Wow, that's a tonight, great story. <laughs> tonight we had chicken. You caught the chickens with, with like a fish almost, that's right. right? Okay. That's right. We lassoed, and then we had a little rice left, and then we had a couple of days food. But anyway, fortunate enough oh, for us, the Japanese had a lifeboat there. And we said, that lifeboat is gonna save our life. Because what we're gonna do is every night, you're gonna move that lifeboat a little farther away from the house. Okay. Maybe let's say maybe a hundred yards. Yeah. Because that is not so obvious. Right. And then, then of, as once we had it in position, we all whatever we owned, which was practically nothing. One suit could have filled everything. 
uh, but we didn't need anything, you know, there was no need for anything. <coughs> but since Henny was so smart, he figured out there's an island, we have to find an island where there's nothing. What's I the mean, name of the island? Samao. Okay. There has to be nothing, no war, no valuables whatsoever to the Japanese. So they would never follow us. So one night it was pitch dark, he says, tonight is the night we're going. Who went, got on the boat? Name the people. Well, it was my mother, my stepfather, and it's my two other brothers. brothers. So that was five of us. Okay. Okay. So at midnight, it was pitch dark. He says, now it's the time to go. So. How did, did you row this boat? How no, did no, no, no. It was a rowboat. That's correct. But we had bed sheets. And we used one of the oars to make a sheet out of it. You made a sail out of a bed sheet and an oar. Right. And then we used the other rudder, I mean the other row, for the, as a rudder. And since so he studied the, the oceans, you know, Henry was such a smart man. I mean, it's amazing. he goes, I can't say enough about him. How long did it take you to get from that beach to the island? I don't know, probably five, six hours. Oh, oh. It was, yeah, it was a small sail. And of course, we had to fight the currents and the waves and all that. Were you but scared on the boat? Never. Uh, with, I, I thought it was the greatest adventure ever. So you were having a good time at oh, some level? I had a wonderful time. I loved it. What were you like as a little boy on that boat? Were you laughing and having fun? Did you have to be serious? Like, give us, give us I, that. I was never serious. I always had fun. Because I said to myself, hey, I, mean, I managed to get through this. What could be worse? So if you can survive getting a big hole blown out of your side, you're going to have right. fun from here on out. That huh? is correct. Wow. So anyway, so we got to the other side to the island uh -huh. and we went which is smart again he went on the lee side of the island what is the lee side that's What's... where the opposite side of the wind okay so the lee side is where the shade is where there's no wind okay or very little and now that the lee side is good is because the currents as they go by the lee side it reverses the current so when everything floats on the ocean comes to the island okay and this is how we found coconut and we found the cans and you know all kinds of stuff whatever stuff magically sort of showed up on the shore for that you is huh? correct it seemed like it anyhow yeah okay so once we got to the island and of course there was nobody and nothing but we did see an old shack there he says well that's going to be our house you found a shack abandoned abandoned nobody there and then that we took over on that one what was your role in the family unit? What did, they, what did he have you do to help keep everything moving forward? My job, well, actually I was not really assigned to anything. I just played and swam, you know. You didn't have to help cutting things or cooking or doing anything? No, not really. But the thing is, uh, but... Uh, we left out something, didn't no, we? No, no, there is something else that has to come. So after we were there for a while, a couple of natives showed up. Okay. Okay, and they introduced, I don't know how they introduced Were themselves. they naked? Well, what were they wearing, the, uh, these natives? Oh, just a line cloth. Line cloth. Very oh. little. All right. Very little. Uh, were they muscular kind of guys? Uh, the men were, yes. Okay. The were women they... were fat. Okay. <laughs> and what happened when they landed on your island? No, they, they, were, they were there. Oh, they were there, but a different part of the island. Way huh? on the other side. Because that island's 50 miles long and 25 miles wide, that, right? That's right. Okay. So there were a few, but uh, the thing is, these people don't move around very much. They have, right. There's no need. They have right. whatever they want is right there. You okay. Know? So, but anyway, so the first few days we ate uh, coconut. Coconuts and then, oh, I don't know, bananas. You know, when whatever. you landed. Yeah, and they had the papaya there. I mean, the thing is you don't go hungry because everything is there. Okay. But that's the funny thing about the jungle. It, it generates its own because once a coconut lands on the ground, on the on the sand there and it gets to the land and it, in no time at all it spouts and then in the year's time it's a coconut tree. Okay, that's how it works, huh? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the most amazing thing. And so, so what's everything else? The papaya, you know, the birds fly over, they drop a seed and this, the, the ground is so fertile it immediately absorbs. So papaya, and, coconut, and, and, and what banana. else? Is, and banana. Yeah. That's what you, you subsisted on. Yeah. And what happened when the villagers came by what did they do oh they just looked around I mean but that time uh, but that time Henry figured out to make coconut oil out of the coconut he again one lucky day a big five gallon no 50 gallon drum showed up just okay. washed up on the beach well, huh? showed up on the beach so we immediately grabbed this is that's perfect we can use that we can cook the coconut oil Okay. Yes. Which, of course, I don't know how. We, I don't know how he managed to uh, 
cut it in half, but he must have had a machete, obviously. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so this is, when those natives came, then we gave them the coconut oil. And they tasted it, and it tasted good, they liked it right away. Yeah. And for some reason, uh, we communicated, I don't know how. Like hand we, signals, probably, hand right? Hand signals. They said they came back and brought us all the food we wanted. Fish, what? chicken, shrimp, vegetables, you name it. What was that like for you when you got a chance to taste shrimp for the first oh, time? it was wonderful. Every day, fresh shrimp from the ocean, still wiggling put them in the pot and eat it. Oh, marvelous. So you ate like a king, it sounds like. Of course, but never any sweets. Right, no sweets. I've never had any sweets in my life. Is that why you're so fit at age 88? Yes. yes. You don't eat sweets? Never eat sweets. Okay, let's keep going with the story. Okay, so then, uh, because we gave the natives that oil, they of course with the native drums, boom, boom, then all other natives came. So they, they drummed other natives who came and got more oil. Got more oil and they brought more food, more chicken, more eggs, more food to be constantly eat. Wow. Oh, so much. So, but Henry still doing his spy business. Now how did, how did you know? You didn't know. I didn't know. know. But it, he just disappeared, that's all. Really? How long would he be gone for? Oh, a month or so. Who knows? You're... He didn't. Th of course, we had no time. We okay. Had no way of... Yeah, right. And there's no count. You, you had no watches. By, by the season. That it's... So, what was it like to grow grow up with no watch, no time? Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I love it. Did Did time go really slow? No, very really fast. Because we didn't swim. Then we we sailed. Every day I went sailing. Now let me tell you about the sailing. Okay, let's talk about the sailing. The thing is, the the lifeboat. I forgot to say that. Once we got on the island, we immediately pushed out the lifeboat and set it out in the current and went go north. See somewhere. you later, boat. So we were cut off from the world. Because you knew they'd find that boat and they'd say, of "We course. know you're here, right?" That's right. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And once a Japanese patrol landed on the island, of course you can hear because it's the motor. You know, right. the I always say, "You guys all hid." Oh, of course. We just went ten feet into the jungle and you could see them walk right by, but they couldn't see you because it's so camouflaged. Did they have guns and of everything? Of course, of course. They... And then with the bayonet in front, you know? So they would have killed you if they oh, would have seen absolutely. you, right? There's no question about Murdered it. Murdered you right there. Right then and there. Was your heart pounding at all? No, we just laughed. This really? stupid that they didn't see us. So you, it was like I, a... I mean, my, myself and maybe the, my brothers, uh -huh. I'm sure my parents were worried. Right. But I didn't even know if Henry was there, you know? So for you, the whole thing was just one big adventure. That's correct. Have you seen any Indiana Jones movies that Steven Spielberg? Yes. Oh, yes. What did you think about your life compared oh, yeah. to Indiana Jones? I could put Jones? myself right in there. Really? Oh, you mean any time I see movies like that, it reminds me of, uh, of something like that. I am very adventurous. Anyway, let me tell you now. Because we were so nice to the, to the natives, they decided they had to give us something. In return. In return. Besides the food. Besides the food. So they decided they're going to give us a brand new handmade outrigger canoe. Did it have two things or one? Uh, two outriggers and it was 30 feet long, all handmade. Did it have a sail? Had a sail, made out of bamboo. Wow. Uh, no, not really. Uh, either bamboo or rattan. I think it was bamboo. Okay. But the thing is, that water, I mean, regardless how rough the ocean was, it never leaked. It was so tight. Who was the captain of the uh, outrigger? Me. What was that like to be a young boy and be able to learn how to sail that outrigger? I felt in heaven every day. I could hardly go on the ocean. You must have had the day. best time ever, right? I did. I had. I was great. Now the thing is, and this was very smart on my part. Stupidity for somebody. Now I said, I'm out on the water all the time, and I have no idea how to swim because I never learned how to swim. So I said to my brother, now I want you, we're going to go out at least a mile away from the island. And then I'm going to jump in the water and don't you dare look back. You go back to the island. Wait, uh, you, had a, you jumped out a mile away from the shore and you swam all the way back with not knowing right. how to swim? That is correct. You didn't worry about drowning? No. That's crazy. I know, but I said to myself, I can do it and I'm going to do it. And then I just thought... First, I did it like a dog, you know, uh -huh. and then eventually synchronized my swimming. You figured it all out right then? That's right. And then what happened after that, as far as your swimming? Did you swim every day once every you figured day. it out? I was so brown, <laughs> like chocolate brown. Were you naked on this island? Of course. 
So everybody was naked or just no, the boys? Uh, no, often not, because I only had one, I had one swimsuit and I had to save it for if, if a company ever shows up. Oh, okay, so you had to keep that good and fresh. Yeah, right. And did you, did you catch, what did you do in the water? What kind of stuff did you do? Nothing. Just sailed around, watched watch the corals and, did you do uh, any body surfing and with the waves or anything uh, you know that that's what's so nice thing about that cove it, the ocean could be just as rough as could be but the cove was always smooth ah. and another very interesting because the tropic is so hot like 120 degrees every right day, yeah the water when it's shallow like a two inch Hot water. so hot. Burn yeah. your feet? That's right. You really had to run into the ocean to go down at least a foot or more that the water cools down. No kidding. And I always said to myself, how did these creatures in the water survive? Like the starfish uh -huh. and, and uh -huh. the worms and all those other critters. But obviously they did. Well, so, well, I know you weren't afraid, but so how many years were you on this island? Four years. And what was the scariest thing or the most dangerous thing that happened to you or that you did? Okay, that's going to be interesting. Now, because uh, Henry found out on the other side of the island, that's 25 miles across, they can have sugar cane because the wind wet side grows sugar cane. The, the sugar cane loves wind. Right. So he <coughs> says to me, Fred, I want you to go on the other side of the island and get sugar from the sugar cane. And here's a flask made out of bamboo, you know, and, I, and I'm giving you coconut oil and you. Trade that, huh? trade that with them. Now he says, the only thing I want you to do is no compass, no direction, there are no trails, nothing. I just want you to remember when you leave tomorrow morning, whatever, it's like five o'clock in the morning, remember now the sun is on the right. Don't you ever turn around or anything. You just keep going to the, that the sun is on the right. You're never going to get lost. And how many miles was it? 25 miles. And was this an easy path? Or oh path? no, that took days. Had you cut through the jungle or what? Yeah, we went through the jungle. But then the thing is, every, 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 see, we're going through the jungle. There were a couple of tr tribes who lived in the middle of the yeah, jungle. Yeah. So, of course, when you come by, you have to stop. You have to stay with them for a day or two and okay. talk and they feed you and make you happy. You know, and they play the drums and uh -huh. knows what. And then you, you buy Was there them. any good looking women in these tribes? I don't know. I, you were too young for that? So no, I had no desire of sex. No whatsoever. beautiful native women, huh? Nah. I mean, true. I looked at them and I said, my boy, what beautiful forms they have. But Were they naked? Yeah. But it didn't mean anything to me. Nothing, huh? Okay. All right. But anyway, so then eventually it got to the side, to the uh, to the leeward side. How many days did it take? Oh, at least three days. And did you have to use a machete to get through? Uh, I think I did, yeah. But he says, Henry said again, don't ever use it unless you absolutely have to. So what he did, I give you a stick with a V on it. So if you see any animals, or especially snakes, just take that stick and push them to the side and they keep going on there. Don't ever confront anything or anybody. Whatever you have to, even if you have to make a big detour, do it. Because it's, it's worthless to confront anybody. That okay. means humans too. Right, obviously. okay. So, did okay. you encounter any snakes? Lots of them. Were they scary snakes or I little don't snakes? Know. I did. I was never afraid of it. You just moved them out of the I way, just huh? Moved them out of the way. They were mostly a boa constrictors. Okay. Because they're big. Right. I mean, they're big, you know. How about boars or pigs? Did they have any wild Not animals? Not on the island. I have to tell you that way. We lived in the on the farm. That's another story. Yeah, we're getting there, right? Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. That that was before. That's why I. But you were just talking about after during the war. Anyway, so I got to the side where we got the where the sugar cane is, I gave him the oil and they were thrilled to death. And then they gave him turned sugar. And then now again, of course, the sun has to be on your left, on the left side, uh -huh. same thing. It says make sure. And of course, by that time I made a little path so I could watch. Uh, <laughs> you know. Now were you carrying sugar home or sugar cane? Sugar. Like white sugar, brown no, sugar? No, it was in liquid form. Syrup. Liquid form. Yeah. Not, not crystallized. How much sugar did you, was it like a gallon's worth or was I it heavy? I don't know, whatever bamboo is this, maybe six inches around. How did you keep it from spilling out? Well, you don't fill it to the top. Okay. So. I mean, you put a string string on it, rattan. Oh, another thing I have to tell you, because we didn't have any water. So if you needed water while you were hiking, you, all you do is you cut the rattan 
And if you cut the rattan, it has it retains a lot of water, and that's the water you drink. So you drank out of the rattan. That's right. And it, would it kind of dribble in your mouth? No, it ran pretty good actually. And you had to figure all that out, and you were never scared crossing that part of the island. Never scared. What about the sugar? Did you like sugar when you tasted it, or? Well, I, well it was sweet. It was good. That's okay. But another thing is, I forgot to say, after you cook the coconut oil, the residue, which is like a crystal layer, is, is sugar. Okay. Because the coconut has a lot of sugar. All right. Because coconut water is very sweet. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the sweetness goes into the meat. And then if you boil the meat, the residue is uh, crumbs. And you can eat these, and it's very sweet. But, you know, since I didn't have any taste for sweets, it didn't mean anything. It was a nourishment. Okay. Let's put it that way. <coughs> I ate a little bit of it. My main diet was everyday fish. Fish. 99 percent in bananas. Sometimes papaya. But basically fish and... Would you cook the fish over an open flame? Yeah. Of, yes. Did you do cooking yourself or did your, did your mom cook? I, I don't know. My mother oh. probably. I All don't right. know. You don't we only that. had one pot and that was pot was safe to boil water. Okay. Now the only way we had water, when it rained, we had a, some kind of system to, to hold the water in. And of course, every time you want to drink water, you had to boil it because of the bugs in the water. So you don't get dysentery. You had to be, that part, you had to be very clean. So you had to bang, bathe yourself every day. And of course, there was no toothpaste, no toothbrush, no soap. So we used to go in the ocean and use my finger and use the salt one and rub the teeth. So give me more about what it, what it was like for you on a daily basis, because that's going to be a big part of the movie, the Jungle Boy part. Did you get along with your brothers? Did you guys have fun? What 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 was your days like? Well, I never got very. His name is Helmut. That's number two boy. I never got along with him because he was a bully. And uh, so and I can't stand bully. And he was constantly pushed my oldest brother was Ernest around. And I used to get very angry. I says, I don't know why you keep doing that. I mean, he doesn't bother you. Why do you do that? It's unnecessary. But anyway, you're talking about daily things to do. Did the three of you go out together? No. Did you go out by yourself? No. Uh, Arthur was another one who disappeared and went somewhere, God knows where. Then he shows up and then he disappeared. No kidding. Never telling you what he was doing or what. But Ernie and I were together all the time. You and Ernie. We were very close. Thick as thieves, huh? Yes, because I'm the boss and he was... Com I didn't want to be. Right. I want him to make decisions, but he says, I don't want to. You had to take the lead. Yeah, you, you do it. You do a beautiful job and let it be at that. What kind of things did you and Ernie do together that were I, fun? I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember now. But the thing is, you're talking about daily things. Now, after these natives uh, gave me that outrigger canoe, Henry decided, you know, some of these guys seem pretty smart because they taught me how to navigate, how to read the stars, the sun and uh, the currents and the waves, because they, they all tell you something if you really watch it. So this, uh, Henry said, you know, these guys are pretty smart. I think I'm going to teach them mathematics. This is your stepdad, Henry? Yes. And other worldly things, you know, so they can understand it a little bit. But of course, for some reason, he managed to talk to them. I don't know how, but anyway. But of course, we didn't have any paper. We didn't have any pencils. We didn't have anything. But we had lots of sand. So when he explains to, him, to them something, and to me also, he said he wrote it out in the sand. So he was your teacher? Yes, he, whatever I knew was through him. Did he ever give you a spanking or any kind of discipline? Never? No. He, says, he said, if you do wrong, you know that you did wrong. Nobody has to tell you that. And if you get in trouble, you work it out yourself. If you can't, then come to me and I'll give you an advice. So he let you figure it out on your own. If you needed help, come to me. I'll help you figure it out. That is wow. Cool. Yeah. And it worked beautifully. Were you happy the whole time? I was... I can't complain. I was happy all the time. When did you go to bed and when did you uh, wake up? Well, we wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning. When the sun came up? Yeah. And did you kind of go to bed right when the sun went down? What did you guys do yes. after when yeah, it got dark? Yeah, went to bed. The minute it got dark. The minute it got dark, yeah. huh? Did but you... the thing is... You had to sleep on the, on the uh, rattan floor. Was that comfortable? No, but I didn't know any better. The mattress and the orphanage were like a rock too, so it didn't make much difference. Uh, no, because you can't have anything because bugs get inside whatever you have. If you have a blanket or a pillow, they 
infest in there and then they bite the hell out of you. That wasn't fun, right? No, so what you had to sleep with nothing. But it never got cold, so it didn't make any difference. Were you sleeping in the nude? Uh, of course. So you were totally like a native. Yes, just like a native. You were the you were the jungle boy. But I didn't know anything about sex. You see, right? Nobody ever talked about it. Nobody, there was no uh, friction. I mean, I don't know exact the words for it, but there was no discussion on it. Uh huh. And nobody how, cared. How, do you remember how your mother was doing while this was going on? Was she enjoying herself? What you was know, her life I like? I don't know. I mean, I tell you, after I became. After I became older, I said to myself, I don't know how in the hell my parents took that. Because all the years we were together in the Philippines, and all the misery that I went through, have never, never once complained. And they said to themselves, we are happy to be here. If it was any place else, who knows how it would have been. Here we are free, we can do whatever we want. We don't have, we don't have to account to anybody, we can do anything we wish. So you have the best life ever then? Of course, I, I thought so. And, and of course, you see another thing, uh, um, materialistic things didn't mean anything to me. Right. Like money right. or anything, it, just, it didn't mean anything. I've, I've never owned a toy in my life, so I didn't know what toys were, okay? And I never had money, so that didn't mean anything to me because we didn't need any. We, all the needs were given to us. Now there's a lot of researchers that study in native indigenous islanders, okay? I took some classes. Yeah. And what they told me, which I don't know is true, but you you might know. They said like living in Tahiti it was like heaven on earth. There a lot of joy and and the natives were Everybody happy. Happy. Happy, right? Happy. Were the natives that were living on Absolutely. were they happy? I, friendly? Yes, very friendly. I've you, never had. If you go by their house and you don't stop and stay with them for sure, that they're very unhappy. They want you to stay with them and visit as long as you want. And they treated you with respect. Respect, all the food, any, anything you want is yours. And you it's spoke an German. House. And what what kind of language did they speak? Do you I think? I have no idea. But you did uh, sign language. Yeah, that's sign language. You know, if you want water, or if you want. A, Okay. You know, whatever sign language it makes, and we know, you know, they know that. Did they so. play? You said they played the drums. Was there any kind of music or kind of fun activities when you stayed with them? Did they do any kind of I, dancing this, I, or anything? I, I can't recall. Okay. You know. All right. I mean, my destiny is to get over there, and my destiny is to come back. Got it. But I had to stop to, to be friendly. I mean, that's very. Important. Talk about that story when you took the outrigger out and the Japanese caught you. Oh, that was yeah, that was something. Anyway, we went sailing. And then all of a sudden, that Japanese uh, power boat, I mean, we could see the patrol boat coming, and then they stopped. And then, of course, Did they point the guns at you and everything? Probably, of course. And then they waved us aboard. But the nice thing about it, which I, I'm thankful <coughs> that they did save the ivory canoe. They tied it up on the back. So they towed the boat back rather than us. casting they it didn't, aside. Yeah, they could have easily tossed it away. So that was a very nice of them. So anyway, we couldn't speak to them. They couldn't speak to us. Were they mean to you? Uh, uh, were you afraid for your know. life? Uh, well, I was, I was concerned what, what's going to happen, you know. But I was not, was not afraid. Okay. Because I didn't know what was in front of me. So how can you be afraid? You don't know what to expect. So wow. you just take it for, you know, if you're so free thinking all the time, why would something like that bother you? Yeah, you I mean, didn't even have any notions to be afraid, yeah, right? Yeah, because we never saw a Japanese soldier in our life. I don't know what they looked like. Okay. We knew Japanese civilians and they were wonderful to us, you okay. know, the families. Uh, but anyway, so they took us to the headquarters, which was in Davao, by the way. Right. And then, of course, we sat there, and then we had to wait all that time till they could find a Japanese soldier or an officer or somebody who spoke German. And they finally did find a, 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 a Japanese teacher in Japan who taught German. So anyway, so he interviewed us, talked about this, that, and the other. And then they say, if you're really German, show me. How, how do you know? He says, can you know, how, do you know how to write German? And by God, I did, because we did it on the sand, you know. With Henry, was, your stepfather. Yeah, but Henry taught us. And do you know how to read? Yes. So they found a book. So I knew how to read and write and speak. And then I interviewed a bunch of, what are you doing? I said, we live here. This is our home. That's why we live here. We didn't say anything else, you know. What, what am I going to say? I mean, I have no history of... Uh, what it went on in Germany, so... Right, and he didn't tell you he was a spy because he probably knew it could save your life, right? Exactly. That was the very reason. Because, you know, they can they know how to squeeze people. Right. So it says, then the, my wise idea was, this, look, you, 
you got a rock on your head. If you want to get rock out, water out of rock, and there is no water, all the squeezing you do doesn't do a bit of good. So, so why did they let you go? What they didn't know what else to do with us. Oh, well, we were kids, you know what I mean? Right. My older, I think he was 15, and I was 11 then, or something that age. Wow. So and they, they just let back. you sail back from yeah, the boat? they took us back where our boat was, and we went home. No kidding. Isn't well, that a miracle? That is a miracle. So, and this was part of the reason why we wanted to get away from the city. We, you know, four years ago, for that reason, because we knew that this Japanese, after a while, they're not going to trust. And especially if it was my parents, it would have been worse. Now, so, while you're living there, were you hoping to get rescued or were you having so much fun you didn't no, want to no, leave? No, no, we wanted, I knew, they had a, of course, by that time I was 14, 15, I said, we really have to get ourselves educated. So, and of course, Henry did tell us, then he said, the Americans are gonna come back because he got the notice. And then of course, another, we saw a lot of American planes flying across. Was this from, after the war was ended or before? No, no, before it ended. Before. Yeah, it, it ended in 46, but in 46, in the beginning of 46, you could see a lot of American planes flying over. Okay. And oh, and, I, and before that, a couple of weeks before that, the Japanese fleet, God, we were afraid. Carter and his fleet came through the channel. Right by your the island. the mainland and our island. Yeah. And he says, God forbid, if the Americans spot us, we're all going to be dead. They're just going to blow it to kingdom come, huh? Everything's going to blow. I mean, you know, our whole ammunition, everything. So we said, oh boy, let's hope that they take a day off or something. Yeah. Because <laughs> they patrol every day. Right. But they, they didn't stay very long. I guess they stayed a day and or so, and then they took off. Oh, we were so happy. And then, sure enough, a few days later, we heard all this banging and explosion. I mean, it was way out in the ocean, but, you know, the, the, the noise... Travels. Travels. So we said, oh, they must have got caught. And then, sure enough, later, the bombers came and start... Uh, but let me tell you another little incident, because we were... Then we were... After it started to slow down, we went out into the ocean again to get... On the outrigger. Yeah, with the outrigger to get... Hope to find a patrol boat to intercept us. To get rescued, huh? Yeah, but in the meantime, there were a lot of fighters flying around. And these fighters, wherever they could see something move in the water and they fight us. So sure enough, they can start strafing us. But Henny told me a bullet never goes straight when it goes in the water. The minute it holds in the water, it bows right away. It says, we're gonna be saved. We're gonna go under <coughs> the boat mm -hmm. so they can shoot at the boat. And of course, when it hits, it part of it bends. So we're not gonna get hit. So how many times did you get strafed by uh, machine guns? In Twice. Our, two different times. Americans or Ameri Japanese? The, not the Japanese, the Americans. The Americans intercept us with the power boat, with the patrol boat. The Americans shot us with, by the airplane. But that then, was scary though, right? Yes, that was scary. Because they were actually shooting at you. That's something else. Would they come by more than one time or just no, one just time? No, just one run. So we said it was, oh, they must have had some ammunition left over. They didn't want to take it home. <laughs> that was our rational okay. thing to think. But anyway, so a couple of days we went out anyway. And sure enough, <laughs> the patrol, uh, PT boat stopped us. And of course, I couldn't talk to them. Right. But then the same line, same, you know, and they came and they landed on the island where we were, picked up our parents because they could barely move. And then they brought us to, to the headquarters. And What was that like to get rescued off the island? It felt good. Well, it felt good because you know, we're going back to civilization. Yeah. I mean, this kind of stuff is good for so long, but eventually you have to do something with yourself. Okay, let's flash, flash forward, and before you tell us where you went, but when, let's say you were 20 or 21, did you ever look, when you looked back on life on the island, how did it make you feel? Did you ever look back and remember those times? Many times. If, I still feel very good about it. Today? Today, even then. But I said, well, I only felt sorry for my parents. That, I mean, the agony they had to go through and that they never complained about anything, even when they came here. I mean, they just accept the fact, I mean, at least in my interpretation. And so I said to myself, once I get to this country and get educated, make money, I'm gonna get every penny I make and give it to them because they need it. So I, after, I don't need it. after you got rescued, tell us the story about how you got from, um, where did you get, where did they take you in off the to island? To Davao. Davao. And then it took a couple years. Yes, it to took two years for finally a freighter because we couldn't take a, there were no passengers or anything. 
who had enough, they were willing to take on 12 passengers, but they had no freight. So they had to take on a lot of water because the ballast was too high. So it get down and coming across the ocean from, the, from Davao to San Pedro, that was 16 days. And you said that was really rocky and a lot oh, of fun, right? It was the right? worst ever. I mean, I've been on rough water with our outrigger canoe where the, the, feet, the waves were 20 feet high. I mean, you literally had to look up to them. But in the outrigger canoe, you're safe. I mean, it's wood, it floats. Even if you flip over, it doesn't matter. It doesn't sink. So I felt very comfortable. But that boat, that freighter, that damn thing really, and the, the captain asked me, Fred, don't go to the front of the bow, on the bow of the ship. Because I wanted to go out there and because it was fun to you at oh, some was, level, right? Oh, to me, it was the greatest thing ever. Like a ride at Disneyland yeah, or something, right. huh? But again, on that freighter, we had to strap ourselves in at night because it was so rough. But I was, I was really amazed that the whole wave come through the whole, complete the whole ship. Huh. And so, then you landed in San Pedro. What year was it that you landed in San Pedro? Is, is, it was February 1948. 1948. What was it like to be in California in 1948? Well, I was too numb. Okay. But I tell you one thing, this was one of our first trains. So we had the money. <clears throat> so he went out and bought, uh, oh, the only request was when we came to the United States, the U.S. Embassy said, you have to come with money. And the minimum would be $2,000. And uh, have a place to stay in San Francisco. Which was a lot of money in 1948. Oh, yeah. I, would, I, I guess so. That's I, like 20000 or 50000 today. Be. Good. As I said, money had no value to me. I didn't know. I mean, I knew 1 to 10 or 1 to 50, what right. that means. Yeah. But monetary -wise, What it cost to buy this or buy that? No idea. Was it hard to adjust? I, I, I guess so. That, those are little details. But you were young enough, you could adjust. Yes. It, it would have been I, harder I had, if you were older, yeah, right? I had no problem adjusting. What's what about that? the first time you slept in a bed? <laughs> that was funny. No, the first time we were wearing shoes again. Shoes! That was because for four years, we had no shoes. You were the, barefoot all the all time. All the time. We had no clothes, no shop, nothing. So the army gave us shoes. Now only could wear for a couple of minutes. And it, even it felt funny wearing clothes. Right. You know, I only so long I had to take them off. And then gradually, of course. <laughs> it took you a while to get used to it, right. huh? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, how old were you when you first kissed a girl? Oh, maybe 22. So how, how many years, well, how old were you when you landed in San Pedro? 20. So it was two years of being here in California before you actually kissed a girl? Yeah. Wow. And it was one other girl, and then I met Joanne. <laughs> okay. And how long have you and Joanne been together, Fred? Since when? 64 years. We got married in 1952. And now it's... Wow. Seven, six, yeah, 64 years. Okay, so we've gotten a good part of the story. Now let's go over some characters. Who are some of the main kinds of people that they could put in the movie that would be really good to be in this movie? Well, I would, I would think that was, uh, he was our sponsor to come to this country. S sort of, you know, I mean, he took, took care of us when we landed in San Francisco. But this man, Mr. Gone is his name. He went to the Philippines in 1899. You're kidding me. He, no, he's fought the Spanish-American War. Wow. 1899. Wow. And we got acquainted with him. And he said to us, not to me, to my parents, says, that Philippine is a gold mine. If, we, if I stay here, I can make all kinds of money. No kidding. And even in all kinds of business, which I don't know. But, yeah. But he said, and that was also before the war, if you ever want to come to the United States, just look me up. He must have been quite a character. Oh, I guess so. Uh -huh. He was very, very friendly, nice. Guy. Was he rich? Yes. I know. Did he have really nice clothes and? I had no. See, materialistic things didn't. You didn't even notice didn't it, huh? Didn't mean the thing. What? And then, how did he sponsor you to come to well, California? Well, let me just tell you. I have to tell you a little bit about the guy. Yeah. So he met his wife, which was a nurse, and she too stayed in the Philippines from 1899. All these for 48 years. No kidding. Not 48. Yeah, it must be four, yeah, 48. Almost years. 50 years. Yeah. Now they were there, but every at that time, which I didn't know, at least that's what at every five years they had to go to the United States, so they don't lose their citizenship. Okay. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Anyway, so that's and they had a wonderful place in San Francisco. 
and they had no children of their own, so they adopted a couple of kids. Okay. But he always had one. He had a car business and he had farms. He had oh, he he was involved very heavily in the Philippine business, but not politically, just making business. But anyway, so uh, uh, we periodically my parents would visit him in the Philippines, but then when the invasion came, they got interned because they were Americans. They were in a concentration camp. Your sponsor, okay. Yes. Now let me tell you how bad that was. Before the war, he weighed about, I would say about 230, 250 pounds. He was a big, tall man. When he came out of prison, out of the concentration, he weighed 80 pounds. So he was a skeleton, huh? Ske so was his wife. But they both survived. That was amazing. So, and of course, they were the first one who uh, got repatriated, went back to the States. So then when we met him after two years in the United States, so all he really did for us, they found us in the apartment and met us at the train station. But that's important that you had yeah, somebody. Because had a, yeah, because that was the requirement. What are you going to do when you get here? And he yeah, filled the bill. Because okay. we had no, who, we didn't know anybody, anything. So, so you're I, in San Pedro. Let me sort of. In case they want to put this in the movie, they had the red cars, the trolley cars going around. What, what do you remember about just being in L.A. in 1948 and oh, 49? Well, from the minute we got off the ship, we got on the train. But, I mean, now this was the California Sapphire. It was so luxurious. We went into the dining room, actually ate in the dining room. And we had the we had a room. Uh, reserved space in the dome car. I mean, to us, that was, I thought I was in heaven. Since I haven't been on a train for years and years and years, I thought that was the greatest thing ever. Considering what's happening, you've been quite lucky, right? I mean, you think oh, about I'm it. lucky all the time. You know, all my life, and I keep saying, doors seem to open for me all the time. And I've always had the guts to go through it. Because I can always go through it. If, it's, if I don't like it, I can always turn back. But I've never turned back, never. It was always go forward, and it's been with me all my life, and I've been very fortunate because of it. Things happen for me all the time. But let me tell you something. So we arrived to San Francisco, which was in February. San Francisco at that time is one of the coldest months. Yeah. So the first thing we had to do, we need neat overcoats. And so somebody said, oh, you know, they have that army surplus stores here in San Francisco. So we did. So we went to the army coat, got the thickest fur coat we could find, and put that on, not to freeze. But anyway, we had a very nice apartment. And then we said, now we have to learn the city. So how are we gonna do that? There, there was a bulletin on one of the buildings there and it had the calmest cigarette, the guy smoking. Yeah. He said, this is the perfect landmark we can see from everywhere. So every day, Henry and I, oh, my mother too, of course. You see, at that time, Ernie and Arthur were not with us. The art came to the United States earlier than we did. He made some connection with somebody. We had, he always disappeared, he was a very independent person. But Ernie had a job with the shipping company there with, for the army, working for the army, so he wanted to, he had to stay, because he needed a sponsor, and we had to be the sponsor for him. We had to wait one year to do that. <clears throat> anyway, so we, we got that, we went. So every day, we, we went on a different... Is that you? Oh, the hell would I don't care. I don't want to It's funny, it only rings at one time. All right, go ahead. Uh, every day we went on a different streetcar or trolley car to went so far, and then we made me a mile or so, then we turned back. But we always looked for that sign. So we could, because I don't know how well my, my parents, they could speak English, but read English. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure. But anyway, so we did that for a few while, and uh, so we got acquainted. With San Francisco, and that was pretty good. And every now and then we visit the Gones and uh, ask us how we were doing. So we're going to let them see your Thrive show. So that, that's going to give more of the big picture stuff. So I want to go more into characters, and we're almost done. So <clears throat> how would you just, looking back at your childhood and yourself, and, and you were the character in the movie, how would you want to be portrayed? Like, wh what, why is it important that we make this movie and, and share your life with all of planet Earth? because possibilities and opportunities are for everybody. It is just your personal, uh, what would I put, I, what is your, I like to use a good word, your self-confidence 
you got to try it because you can my attitude was always I start from nothing and you can only go up so if you drop down to nothing you can always start again as long as you got your health and you sense a good sense of humor and you're good to humanity works fine and another thing is don't get always set up listen to the other person what he has to say it's not your way it's not my way it's our way we have to come to an un to an understanding because otherwise we don't get anywhere and that goes for everybody in anywhere in the world don't get don't don't get so sidetracked and do it your way it doesn't work in his it has helped me all my life i thought it was the greatest thing ever that i had the opportunity and and give Give from you to try to help other people because the opportunity you had, you should give it to someone, somebody else and pass that on. If you can do that, I think we will have a better world, regardless how it looks today. And you think that your story would inspire all humanity because you had, it, you had some rough times, but you always had the right attitude, you were positive. I and you less confidence. No, no matter what? Regardless what. What's the worst thing that's ever happened to you? I'm sure people would want to know. What would you say was the worst thing that ever happened? God, I really have to think. You don't have any kids, right? Yes, we, have th uh, we had three boys. Three children? Yes. W okay, just wondered. Yes, we have three children. Unfortunately, our oldest one has passed away. Always stress. He doesn't know how to relax. See. Our son, that sewer boy, unfortunately, he got involved with the wrong people. Hmm. And he's lost in this world somewhere. We feel very bad. Huh. And he was a big burden on us, and we tried so hard to help him, but... It's tough. Do. Very tough. That's Would you say that's the worst thing? Yes. I think that's not a dimension. I think that's the worst because thing. Because you loved and loved and loved, and you tried we your very best, and still... And, 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 you know, we, I said we had three boys, and I spent most of my time with that child. Of course, at the time, I didn't know it, but he needed my help. And we tried. Joanne tried. We tried everything. But we didn't know enough about psychiatry and that because this is just lately right. you can get medication yes. and all right. that. You see, in our time, in the in the fifties, they didn't know enough about these right. things, unfortunately. So, so that was probably the toughest thing. Yes, I would say yes. But you feel like you gave it everything you could. And then some. And to this day, if I could find a good help, I would do the same thing. I know it would be a terrible burden on us, but it, is, it has to be done if you, if you can do it. But it seems to me your motto is, if you're in charge of it, if you're in control of it, you're going to figure out a way to make it work. If 100%. it's about you, right? 100%. Other people, you're going to do your best to help them, but you can't make it right for everybody. No. But you're going to make it right for you. That's right. I try, as, I try to help them as much as I can because they have to take the initiative. Right. That the old saying is my... Oh, Henry used to say, you can bring a horse to the water, but you can't make it drink. Or think. Well, yeah, <laughs> and this is so true. <coughs> right. you got to be an island within yourself. You have to have 100% confidence in yourself. And I did, and I always will.